Hey everyone, in this video I really want to provide kind of a hints and tips and a study cram session for the new SC900 exam. This is the Microsoft Security Compliance and Identity Fundamentals exam. Uh, currently at this time it's in beta, uh, I just took it last week. Um, it's a fundamentals exam. Essentially what you're going to get with this, it's 60 minutes, so it's a short exam, and I had 50 questions. Now, the actual time it took me to finish was 11 minutes. Uh, the questions are one-line things, and it's really about do you know what feature to use, or what functionality this feature provides. You don't know how to configure it, you don't need to know any kind of depth around these things. It's super, super broad. And the questions are really just rapid fire. Hey, this feature, what does it do? Or I need to do this, what feature should I use? And you'll just get a list of features to select. So it is very, very high level, but it is super broad because the title is Microsoft. So really what that entails is we are thinking about, well, yes, it's kind of Azure AD for the identity side. Yes, it's Azure for some of the services, but it's also Microsoft 365 as well. So it's this broad kind of coverage across all of those different things. Additionally, there were questions about just general principles of compliance and principles around um, transparency and trust. So we kind of need to know all of those different things, but again, at a very, very high level. Now the best place to start is if we actually go to the Microsoft uh, SC900 site. And again, if you pass this, then you're gonna kind of get this Security Compliance Identity Fundamental Certification. And what you wanna do is, as we go and look at this, so go through the site, and then we can think about, it tells you, hey, I can schedule it for, currently it's the beta, it's going to tell you the skills measured and it's talking about well hey yeah the core concepts of kind of security compliance identity and then the microsoft identity access management solution so a lot around azure ad and then kind of those security and compliance as they broach azure and microsoft 365. we can download the skills outline where it then goes into more detail about well, what are all the different objectives, the skills objectives, the functional groups, and the individual skills we need to know about. So what you want to do is kind of go to this site, look at this list, and make sure you can kind of tick off in your brain, yeah, I, I know what those are. And the key word here is everything is describe. I don't have to implement, I don't have to architect, I just have to know what the thing does or know what thing I need to achieve a certain task. And in terms of preparation, they have a free learning path. And honestly, my recommendation would be to go through that learning path. And I think that will kind of put you in really kind of good stead and um, to pass the exam. Again, it, it's a super simple exam. It really is, it's rapid fire. You can kind of give yourself a minute per question and they're not big questions. It's literally a line. And then it's either, hey, what component do I use? Or it's, this is the component, what does it do? That, that's really all it's gonna be. Now, I mentioned there are some kind of general principles across all of them. And what I wanna do kind of here is to go through those as kind of that study cram. A lot of people use my kind of, um, these videos, they'll watch it just before the exam, or maybe at the start, to kind of bring everything together, a bit of a revision. So the first thing we really want to think about is this whole kind of defense in depth. Now the whole point here is I don't want to rely on one thing, uh, kind of like an onion, we have all these different layers. I want multiple layers of protection in case one thing fails, well then there's something else to kind of back that up and protect it. So we think about, well I want to protect things like the data. So here we think about, well, kind of encryption. And we think about encryption at rest, i.e. in place, encrypting the data on the storage. And we think about in transit, as it's going over the wire between where it is and what wants to use the data. 
then I can think about the application that's using that data. I want to make sure the application is well written, there's no vulnerabilities. We think about the compute. So obviously there's some compute service, could be a virtual machine, could be a container. Or make sure I've got protection built into that. Maybe it's uh, limiting what ports are open. Maybe it's having a, a firewall config. Uh, Anti-malware is up to date. All of those things to make sure that's healthy as possible. Then we think about, well, there's kind of the network. And in terms of the network, we think about maybe segmenting the network. You'll hear things like network security groups, other solutions there. And um, we think about limiting the types of traffic. We think about the perimeter of the network. So a key thing here you might think about like distributed denial of service protection. This is where some bad actor has multiple things firing at your uh, public facing service just trying to swamp it and take it down. And Azure for example has protection against this. There's different levels of that. And the Microsoft services, well that's their responsibility, they have protection against that. And then a huge one is the identity. So in, in the old days, the, the network was the big security perimeter. As we move to the cloud, the network is, is not ours anymore. So this really becomes the key security perimeter for us. And so then we start thinking about all the strength of that identity. A big focus is always MFA and things that can drive that stronger authentication when we're going to access things. And then there's just kind of physical security. Now, in the cloud, that's not your responsibility. That's kind of Microsoft to secure the physical data centers. But I want all of these things. And if I am responsible for a certain layer, and we'll talk later on about kind of these shift in who is responsible for what, I want to do everything I can. Now, sometimes you'll see, even though you're responsible, it doesn't mean you're on your own. Sure, I might be responsible for user accounts, for example, but there are tools there to help me make that as secure as possible. Now, when you think about this whole security, all these defense in depth, I've got all these layers, in case one fails, there's another layer to kind of protect it. You'll sometimes see this kind of CIA. And what that CIA really boils down to is kind of confidentiality. So I'm thinking about sensitive data, uh, my encryption. I'm thinking about integrity. So making sure my data isn't tampered with, making sure that that really is what was intended, what was there originally, someone hasn't changed that in some way. And then we think about availability making sure I can actually get to my service, it's available to those that need it. And these are super important things to consider when I'm planning out my environment. Because there's, there's a saying, it's kind of, you can be secure and out of business. Um, I've worked with some companies that have so much bureaucracy, they make it so hard to do anything, that yes, they're secure, but they're not in innovative. <laughs> they can't embrace new features. They can't offer great features to their business units and really differentiate themselves from the competition because they're just stuck in the Middle Ages. Oh, I'm going to super focus on this tiny thing that really doesn't improve their overall security posture, but they just get stuck on it. And so there's always this fine balance be between being secure and being able to do business. You want to find kind of that, that good balance between them. So I want to think about those kind of three things, the confidentiality, um, the integrity and the availability of my data. Now, when we think about security, we're often thinking about, well, threats. Things that can do bad things to our environment. And what are we thinking about here? What are those kind of threats? Now, I can think about kind of a data breach. And this is often kind of the worst one. The idea of a data breach, i.e. our data has been stolen, that can destroy a company. If I have, maybe it's data for my company, my intellectual property, if that's taken by someone else, that's a huge problem. Maybe I have my customer's data with their personally identifiable information is taken, that's a huge problem as well. 
So we can think about, hey, a threat is someone takes our data. This is where encryption comes into play and those strong network defenses, the identity defenses to make sure where someone breaches an identity, well, then they could probably go and bypass any other protections I have, but they could change it and go and get the data. So it's not just, hey, encrypt the data, it's, hey, I want strong network, I want strong identity to make sure there's no weak link in the chain. Then we think about things around sort of a dictionary attack. So if I think about what this is about, really this data breach is, hey, I'm trying to get data. I'm going through various controls to get at the data. This is about trying to get to the identity. And so a dictionary attack is, hey, there's a list of common passwords. I just go at a certain account going through that list of passwords. And I might do substitute in like an O for a zero, those very simple, easy things. Um, we're gonna do that. That's kind of a brute force type attack. I don't really have any intelligence behind it. I'm just hammering this thing, trying to attack it. And there are things like Azure AD Smart Lockout that give me protection from that. Hey, it would stop those, those attempts coming in. I mean, it's gonna alert, it's gonna say, hey, there's a risk, I can see this attack happening. There are things we can do. That also might be trying to actually disable the account by doing all these bad authentications to it. And again, that smart lockout would protect my AD account. Now I can also think about um, under here, like a phishing attack. Now a phishing attack is where it's an email coming to the user, so it's almost like a social engineering, but it's still trying to get at the identity. Hey, um, click this link, um, I need you to do this re-authentication. Normally they're pretty badly written, they're kind of obviously bad, but people click the link and hey, type in the password and now their identity is compromised. You might also see kind of a spear phishing attack. Now, so all of these are around trying to get the identity. Let's just clear that up a bit. And the spear phishing is different from the regular phishing attack in that it's targeted. There's a bit more effort has been made. They've built a database about the users, maybe they understand who their manager is, um, what they type of things they do, and it's now a focused attack. This email will come to them that looks like, hey, it came from their manager. It looks like it's legitimate. So it really increases the chance that they're gonna click that link and you take the credentials. So there's more effort for the attacker there, but then it's gonna get me access to their identity. And again, if I get the identity, um, I can pretty much do many, many other types of things. Now I can also think there's things like ransomware. So we always hear about things like WannaCry, these are attacks that get into the network and then they encrypt the data and they, hey, you pay me this money or I won't unencrypt your data. It disrupts the business. And then there are other just types of disruptive attack. For example, it, it could be kind of a distributed denial of service attack. I'm not really getting anything out of it other than stopping that company being able to do business. So there's all these different types of things that are threats to me, and then there are others as well. But these are all around kind of, and this is kind of the ability to do business, so availability. So understand these types of threats and what they get to. But again, if my identity is compromised, then, hey, I, I can really do a lot of bad things because if I've got someone's identity, I can probably go in and change other things and modify everything else. So they're the threats. Um, what can we do against some of those things? So a big thing you're gonna see is this kind of zero trust. That, that's really kind of a big push today. And really the whole idea is just to assume compromise. you don't trust that your network is secure. You assume that even if I'm behind a firewall, my network is compromised. Um, I don't trust anything. So what I want to do is verify 
everything. If I trust nothing, then I want to verify everything. And I want to verify explicitly. So I think about if there's communications between different devices, well, what I want to do is kind of a, an authentication. So I think about an auth n and then an authorization, an auth z. And we'll talk more about the difference between those in a, in a little bit. I want to think about least privilege. So I think about just in time. So just in time means I only get the permissions I need at the time I need it for a limited window. I don't have a privilege all the time. I only get it when I have to do something. So I would go and elevate up my permissions. I do the task that requires that elevate permission and then I lose it. So if I was compromised, ordinarily they won't get anything significant they can do with my compromised account. And then we think about just enough kind of administration. And that means don't make me a global administrator. Don't give me more privileges than I need to do the job. Give me just enough to do the task. So I work out what are the permissions required to do the task, and I get a role that only has that ability, and I combine them. So I get a role that gives me just enough to do the job, and I only get that role when I actually need to do it. So we, we verify everything, we use these least privilege, and, and really we just assume breach. So if we kind of assume breach, we're going to segment the network. So we segment everywhere we can. I don't have just kind of this broad communication. I'm going to segment. I'm going to encrypt in case there's some bad agent, some bad thing on my network. I want to be able to detect different types of threats. So I'm going to have solutions running that are looking at the logs, looking at the types of interaction, using machine learning, and actually generating results from that, being able to actually see different types of threats. So what we'll see is when, when we think about these things, we focus on a number of key types of objects. So, so to do this, to accomplish all of these different things, actually we come out for a second, what we really focus to accomplish this, we focus on the identity. And I can think about the identity is kind of a user, an application, a service, the device. The devices we use have identities. I think about device monitoring. I need to be looking at these things so I can detect, hey, if something's going wrong. I want to understand the applications being used. I want to think about data classification. Because ultimately, we do all these different things most of what we care about <laughs> is the data. Um, I want to make sure for my data, well, the important data, I mean, really, probably everything is encrypted, but then also I have things like data loss prevention. I want to make sure it can't be used in bad ways. And then obviously, we do think about kind of the infrastructure, the networks, etc. So there's all these kind of different elements that I have to think about and protect. Now, there are some key kind of concepts. And again, we're going pretty rapid because this is the exam, super broad. We just need to understand these core concepts. Now, I've mentioned encryption a, a bunch of times. And one of the things that is important to understand is, well, what are the types of encryption we're going to use? And you can really think there's, there's really two types of encryption. So if I think about encryption, You're going to hear about um, symmetric. So I think about a symmetric encryption. And then you'll hear about asymmetric. So you're going to see these two types of encryption. And really the point of it is with symmetric, I can think about, hey, look, I have my data. 
I run it for an algorithm that uses a particular key, and then I get kind of this encrypted data on the other end. It's been encrypted. Now to decrypt it, I use the same key. So if I actually think about if I, the key is going through the algorithm to create the encrypted version, it's exactly, that was key one, I also use exactly the same key, key one again, to go from the encrypted back to the data. So that's symmetric. This is very efficient for large scale and um, kind of encrypt decryptive data. Asymmetric um, is different. There's now two keys. You'll often hear the idea of kind of a public key and a private key. And as the name kind of suggests, and these are paired together, there's an equivalent public key for the private key. Private key I keep to myself, public key everyone can know. And the idea about this is, if I had kind of this data again, if I want to send it to someone encrypted, I would encrypt it with their public key because everyone knows it. So I would encrypt it with the public key to get kind of this gobbledygook, whatever. It can only be decrypted with the private key, which only they have. So then they get it back again. So if I want to send something to someone encrypted, oh, and I don't really have a good way to exchange the key, which is what symmetric, how do I exchange the key? There's a challenge there. So with asymmetric, there's a public and private key. So if I want to send something to someone that only they can read, I encrypt it with their public key that everyone knows, but the public key can't be used to decrypt something that was encrypted with the public key. I have to use the corresponding key, i.e. the private, which only I have. So that would be encryption of the data. Now, sometimes I want integrity. I, I want to make sure no one has messed with the data. Uh, I want to make sure it really uh, arrives as it was sent. So if I think about that is kind of the security, security side protecting the data, the other thing you'll often do is, hey, I want to send a bit of data and make sure the person that receives it knows no one has changed it. So now I have a piece of data, and what we can do is we can generate a hash. So a hash is really a digest of the data in some value that I get. And then what I do is I encrypt the data, that hash, with my private key. Remember, only I have my private key. So then I can send to the person kind of that data and that hash value encrypted with the private key. So then they get the data and they run it through exactly the same hashing algorithm to get a hash value. They then, because it was encrypted with the private key, they can then decrypt this value with the public key, and they can make sure they match. So hey, that results in hash. If they're equal, then I know the data was not modified. I, I can guarantee the integrity of the data. Because remember, the public key can decrypt something encrypted with the private key. So was the other. So if I want to protect encrypt data to someone, I encrypt it with their private with their public key. If I want to send something to someone that only they can read, encrypt it with their public key, so only they can decrypt it with their private key. If I want to send something out and guarantee the integrity of it, that no one's messed with it, then I would create a message digest, a hash value, encrypt it with my private key, and then send the data and that encrypted hash value. So now they get the data, they run it through the same hash algorithm to get hash value, and make sure it matches the hash value that only I could have encrypted because only I have the private key. So it means it's guaranteed it wasn't changed in transit. So that's how I can really think about using the types of encryption that Symmetric to encrypt bulk data, asymmetric to send small amounts of data, and to verify message integrity. And what you'll often see is them mixed together. 
if I want to have a, an ongoing large scale encryption, I might use the asymmetric to share a symmetric key. That's how I can securely share that key. And then I'm good going forwards. So that's kind of encryption. Now, the next thing I want to talk about is I mentioned kind of this idea of responsibility. And we do get this idea that there's shared responsibilities. Now, if I think about it, there's a huge number of layers. Now, I always draw these kind of number of layers things. But when I start to think about responsibility from this perspective, there's actually more layers than I would normally talk about. So I can think about, well, there's kind of the physical data center. I can think about in that physical data center, there is a physical network. And then there are physical hosts. So these are all kind of real world objects. And then I can think about, OK, well, now I run an operating system. I might have kind of network controls. My NSGs, and we'll talk about those. Um, I have my applications. And then there might be kind of uh, an identity and directory infrastructure. So I talk about ID and directory infrastructure. And then we get into this idea, well, on top of that, there's like accounts and identities. I can think there's devices. And then there's information and data. Now, if I look at that, if I think about on-premises, then obviously all of these things are the customer because it's on-prem. There, there no, there's no cloud involved in this. So when we start talking about the cloud, there are different types of service. We think about like infrastructure as a service, um, i.e. kind of a VM in the cloud. So as soon as you get into any kind of as a service, this always becomes the responsibility of the cloud provider. I, in this case, Microsoft. You never have access to a physical data center or physical hosts or physical network. That's always going to be us. Now, if you think about kind of the responsibilities then, in a VM world, you control the OS, you control the network, it's on your virtual network. So in this case, this is now the customer. Now, this is responsibility. Again, doesn't mean you're on your own. There are solutions in Azure to help you patch the operating system, back up the operating system, replicate the operating system, have anti-malware, network security groups, um, Azure Firewall. There's all things to help you do it, but fundamentally, you own the responsibility of it. Then you start moving into PaaS solutions. So PaaS like a platform as a service, and there's many, many different types. So it becomes uh, a bit more muddled at this point. Now, one of the things I can kind of flip on this is essentially these are always the customer. So this is always going to be the customers, the accounts, the devices, the information data. It's always your responsibility to protect that. Again, there's toolings to help you, but that's always going to be the customer across those. But in the PaaS world, there kind of becomes a, a, a shift. Now, I can think about the OS in this world, well, that becomes the cloud in addition to all that physical stuff. This is always the customer. This now becomes kind of a joint responsibility. There are aspects that is the customer's responsibility. There are aspects that are kind of shared. So here, this now becomes some kind of shared responsibility. There are aspects that, hey, the vendor is responsible for. There are aspects that, hey, you are responsible for. And then finally, there's software as a service. So in, in a software as a service world, and I guess I'll pick a, another color, really the line now goes other layers up. You're not responsible for the app or the network. But again, the identity, the directory infrastructure for the SaaS, 
Well, that's now all kind of the cloud. And then that is always you. But now this little piece here is shared. The idea of kind of the identity directory infrastructure, there's kind of a shared model. But again, the customer is always responsible for this part. When I think about no matter what I'm doing, SAS, PaaS, IaaS, the infrastructure and data, the devices, the accounts, that's your responsibility. There are services to help you, but you ultimately own that. So it's important to kind of understand how they shift. Essentially, as I move from IaaS to PaaS to SaaS, I'm responsible for less and less. Um, as soon as I get out of IaaS, I don't care about patching the OS anymore um, or antivirus on the OS or any of those things. And as I move from PaaS to SaaS, I don't care about the application or network controls anymore. It's really just how do I use that business driving service and there's things like the apps, um, the data, the identity that I'm responsible. I need to make sure I'm using the right tooling, um, the right licensing maybe to protect it as best I can. Okay, so that's kind of uh, the, the general responsibility and, and those types of things. We've got these different threats, the trust. So then we start to move on into more about principles, service trust, and service specifics. Now, for all of these things, for all of the Microsoft services, let's go to 100%, there were kind of these key principles that they really drive behind. And you'll see Microsoft talk about kind of these six key privacy principles. You need to know these. So there were these six privacy, um, you have these principles. So the first one is about control. So putting the customer in control um, of your privacy making sure you have the various dials you can use, the tools to make choices about what data you want to be made available to others maybe, how you want it to be used. And then it should be transparent. It should not be confusing. You shouldn't have to go and dig around to work out what data is collected so you can make the right decision. Where there is data, protect it. Use strong encryption, uh, strong security to make sure if you're entrusting data to Microsoft, um, they're good custodians of that data. And you'll hear about kind of strong legal protection. Now, obviously, the, this is kind of an interesting point. And you'll see in the court case that, hey, someone goes to a cloud provider and says, give us the customer's data. So it's about respecting the local laws of the country and fighting for the privacy of us as humans. Uh, this fundamental right that we're entitled to privacy. Don't use the data for targeting. I.e. if it has our emails, um, if it's got our chat files, don't use any personal content to drive advertising for some other service. And make sure there are benefits to you. I, we're collecting this data, it's to benefit you as the customer to enhance your experience. So those are kind of the six key privacy principles of Microsoft. And again, know what they are. Um, you might get a question about that. So know which ones our key principles. Hopefully that makes kind of sense. Um, why? Now, if we think about that, then we really come down to this idea of trust. I mean, it boils down to that. So how do we get insight into the various aspects that surround all of those things? And the biggest one you're going to start with is the service trust portal. This is really your go-to place. And I'm actually going to open this up and we'll take a look at this. So if I jump over here, 
So it's just servicetrust.microsoft.com. And straight away, you can kind of see where it talks about audit reports. So uh, SOC, FedRAMP, ISO 2701, PCI, DSS, and there's a whole bunch of these. If I click this link, then I go to kind of the audit reports, and I can see a list of documents about all the different types of audit reports across um, FedRAMP and GRC and uh, PCI, ISO, and you can download these massive amounts of documentation about these various things. So this service trust portal is kind of this starting place where you're going to kind of want to go. So we have all these different types of audit reports. Now we also have kind of the compliance manager. So this enables us to actually go and measure and manage our compliance against various types of standard. And I can kind of go into here, and it distinguishes between things I'm responsible for as a customer and things Microsoft is responsible for. So you can see I've got 75%, so that seems like it's going really well, and so you notice how the points were achieved. So I have 90 out of 4,008, whereas Microsoft has 12,093 out of 12,093. So Microsoft's doing significantly better than me. But it gives me the things that I can work on to actually improve my compliance. It gives me them broken down by categories, and there's various types of kind of assessments, and I can view the improvement actions. But it, it's giving me that data. So this is kind of a real key place where I can actually go and manage these things. So it actually, I can track, I can allocate, it really helps me uh, get details. There are different types of solutions across this here. I can see oh, what I should do. I could select this, for example. Um, I could assign the action to someone. I could track when I want it done by. It really is a complete management tool of this. Now, additionally, we can see, hey, look, there's all kind of trust documents. There's those audit reports, there's data protection, other things is broken down by industry. So there's particularly industries I care about or regions, I can see that here. Here we're kind of talking about the documents, penetration tests, and the compliance manager, industry compliance, services, regional, the security and compliance center. And that, that trust center really is a huge one for going and tracking kind of all those different compliance settings. So I find myself a lot here in this trust center because this is where you can actually go and start finding out. So, okay, well, compliance, for example. What are all the different compliance offerings available in Azure by the different solutions? So I could see, okay, um, Microsoft Azure, for example, over here. I can see all the different compliance offerings. So if I select that, and here we go. So these are all the different compliance offerings that exist. And I could click into these and go and get all the different details. If I'm trying to work out, hey, um, does Azure, Microsoft 365, or Dynamics have this, I would start in the Service Trust portal. Then I go to the Trust Center. And then I can see, hey, one's for Azure, and really dive into this. And if there's documents that I really care about, I can kind of save them. So if we think about it, if I go back to here, I can have a My Library. So the things that I really care about, I can go and notice here it's saying Save to Library, and then it will always be available to me, very easy to access. So that's kind of a, a lot of stuff already, and really that's just the more generic things. But it's important you do know all of those different kind of principal things. Now, once we hit those and we understand those, then it really does kind of break down into three core areas. I can think about, well, there's Azure AD, because remember, identity and the health of that identity is key. And then from the Azure AD, we have things like Azure, and we have Microsoft 365. So obviously both of these use an Azure AD instance for its identity. So that's the next kind of drill down, deep dive we, we have to kind of think about. So 
if we start thinking about Azure AD. Now, for Azure AD, like kind of any identity, there are really four key pillars that I have to think about. I can think about the pillar of administration, i.e. kind of the management. I can think about the authentication, sometimes write auth n. I can think about the authorization, auth z. And then I can think about the audit. And they're the kind of four key things that we have to think about. So again, if I think about administration, well, that's the management. Authentication is proving who I am. Authorization is what I can do. And then this is kind of, well, what have I done? And so they're all key pillars to that kind of complete solution. And I want to kind of just dive into those. So if I think about administration, um, one of the key things you're constantly going to see is modern authentication. And modern authentication is all now about the idea that we have a centralized identity provider. And I want to be able to use that by multiple services. We want to move away from this kind of legacy type authentication that, that I have this credential just for this one service. I now think about with this modern orb, I have a token. And that token I can use um, across a range of services. We think about consent. I'm going to say, hey, this service, you can go and perform this on my behalf for me. You'll hear about OAuth 2. You might have seen it on kind of Facebook app where it says, hey, you're going to access this app and you sign in as your Facebook. And it says, hey, we want to do this on behalf of your Facebook data, maybe post to your page. You're consenting that that can work on your behalf. But also as part of this modern auth, then we do have the idea around kind of strong policies of auditing. So I think about policy, audit. Um, and, and really the whole idea of detecting risk. They drive a strong modern authentication. Now, what is my authentication world? Now, we're used to the idea, and again, you don't need to know the basics around this, but we're very much used to the idea that we have an Active Directory. So this is kind of our Active Directory domain services on premises. And we have just kind of users and groups and devices. And then we have the idea of Azure AD tenant. We have an instance of Azure AD. This is not an instance of Active Directory domain services in the cloud. It might seem that way. It's not at all. This is all focused around kind of modern authentication. Um, OpenID Connect, OAuth 2, um, WS Fed, SAML. You hear these modern authentication. And what we do is we enable a synchronization of our accounts. So now we have this thing called Azure AD Connect, or Azure AD Cloud Sync is the new one, but we'll focus on Azure AD Connect, that synchronizes the accounts. What this does is it gives us this single sign-on, this seamless sign-on. So I have one account, and whether or not I'm accessing services, for example, that trust AD, or if I'm accessing some cloud service up here that trusts Azure AD, for me, it's very much a seamless experience. And this Azure AD is really behind the idea of that modern authentication. It is a, a cloud-based IDP, an identity provider. It speaks cloud. It speaks, again, Open ID Connect. It speaks OAuth 2. It speaks SAML. It speaks all of those cloud things. Now, as part of these um, synchronizations, we send up the user objects, we send up the group objects, we can send up things like a hash of the user's password hash. So I can maybe do some enhanced protection looking for compromised accounts because the hash of the password hash is up there. I can find out if something bad has happened. Now in that Azure AD, there's various types of objects. 
in this Azure AD, obviously, we have users. Now, these could be synchronized users, and they could be accounts I create directly in Azure AD. Now, they can also be a guest. So a guest is also kind of this B2B. And that means business to business, and it's someone that I collaborate with. It's someone in another organization. This could be someone in a different Azure AD. It could be a Microsoft account. It could be a Gmail. It could be just someone else entirely. I could use Federation. I could use a one-time passcode. But essentially, I can make them a known entity to my Azure AD. And then I can, so that they authenticate against their home account. And then I can authorize them to actually do something. So I can have native users. I can have guests. I can also have things like service principles. So if I register an application, so I have some app. When I register, I make it an enterprise app. It gets a service principle that represents that app. So when I register applications, it's going to get a service principle. I can have things like a managed identity. So managed identity is really the idea that, hey, I have things that trust this Azure AD. One of them could actually be Azure. And inside my subscription that trusts that particular Azure AD instance, I create some resource. That resource can automatically get an identity that only that resource can act as. So it uniquely has a particular managed identity. It saves me trying to store a password or something else. It's just available to it. So I'm going to have managed identities. I can have groups. Now, groups can be assigned. So assigned means I manually say, well, these users are in this group. Or it can be dynamic. So dynamic, as the name suggests, I can have basically a, a query based on attributes of the user. Hey, you are now a member of this group. So if my department matches this, I'm in it. If my description matches this, I'm in this group. And these are very powerful because from groups, I can do things like assign uh, applications. I can assign them licenses, uh, even roles. So in terms of a, a life cycle, a governance, groups are very, very powerful. So I might use a dynamic group to add people in as they change roles based on maybe their title, their department, and that automatically would give them certain apps and licenses and roles. And obviously, if they move out of the group, they would lose those things. So a big thing we'd like to do is grant permissions to groups rather than individual users. And then, of course, I have devices. Now, when I think about devices, obviously, we've had this idea of here of AD uh, and then Azure AD. So I can think about from Azure AD, there is really three different models I can have. Uh, I can have joined. So in a joined world, this is kind of win 10. If it's joined, I'm going to authenticate with an Azure AD account. That's probably going to be a corporate device. So if I'm going to be joined, that's probably kind of a corp device. Then I can have registered. So that's probably going to be personal. That's my device. Now that can be a whole range of different types of devices. Um, from a, a registered perspective, that could be Windows 10, um, iOS, Android, um, I think Mac OS. They're known to Azure AD, and I'm going to sign in with a personal account. And I can also do hybrid. So hybrid is when the device is known to both Azure AD and Active Directory Domain Services. And when I authenticate, I'm essentially getting tokens for both of those things. And again, that's, that's going to be a corporate account I'm using. Um, Windows 7 Plus, Windows Server uh, 2008 Plus. I can kind of use that hybrid model. So Azure AD is that identity provider. And I can think about it, it's all these different types of objects that I can have within there. 
But a key thing is uh, things like guests when I want to collaborate. So this that really is the key point of a guest. They're people I want to collaborate with. Now, completely separate from that, I may have customers. And so here, there's kind of a separate, it's a separate Azure AD tenant. This is called B2C. So it's Azure AD B2C, business to consumer. So now these people are my customers. And really, you've got those things over here, but now I can also have things like Facebook, um, Twitter, uh, Weibo. There's, there's a, a whole list of these. But now users can bring their social identity to authenticate against the Azure AD B2C. And then I write my app that trusts that Azure AD B2C for the authentication. Um, so that's how I can think about bringing all of that together. Now, Azure AD, there's a whole bunch of different versions. Um, you don't need to know the, the details of them. If I quickly show up the page, really it breaks down into there's premium SKUs and there's free, and then there's if you have Microsoft 365 licenses. So what we can kind of see is the free, hey, I, I can do a lot of things with the free. I've got my device registration, I can even do things like MFA, but it's very basic MFA with the free, basic reports. And then with Microsoft 365 licenses, I can do custom branding, self-service password reset for cloud accounts. But it's really when I get into the premium, we get all these more advanced things like conditional access. You'll hear me talk about conditional access. I need premium, either P1 or P2, and they come with other licenses like some of the Microsoft 365 E3 and E5. But you'll see you get all these enhanced features when you get those premium licenses. And then with P2, that's where you get things like identity protection, um, privilege identity management, i.e. just in time, access reviews and entitlement management. Okay, so that's really built around kind of that core, just thinking of, hey, all of that was really around kind of the management and what we can do. So the next thing we start thinking about is, okay, well, if that's the administration side, what about the authentication? So I'll come over here. So remember, authentication is the first thing that happens. And again, we say kind of auth n authentication. So this is first. After someone has created the account, if I go to the Azure portal, the first thing I have to do is authenticate. I have to prove I am who I say I am. Now, how do we do that proof? So remember, this is all about who I am. Now, we can have a password. And generally, we don't like that very much. Just a password on its own very unpopular today. Um, so we want to move into MFA. So remember, the whole point of MFA is multi-factor authentication, i.e. it's something I know, something I have, something I am. So something I know, hey, uh, a pin, a password. Something I have could be my laptop, could be a phone, uh, a token. Something I am is a biometric. Um, a 3D facial scan, my thumbprint, iris, one of those things. So MFA is obviously much stronger because it's multiple factors. A password would be a factor. It's something I know. So what I want to move to is MFA. So I can think about, really there's, there's different types of MFA. So one of the things I could do is it could be like an SMS message, or it could be a call to my phone. So that's one aspect I could do with MFA. And that's better than nothing, but it's not super popular. People always worry about hijacking a SIM or something like that. So then we can move beyond that and we start thinking about things like, well, we have the Authenticator app. 
And from there, we can kind of show a code, we can show a notification. And um, we have kind of software one-time passcode tokens or hardware one-time passcode tokens. So that's MFA. You'll even then shift on to idea even better is you move to the idea that there is no password. You might hear of Hello for Business. And the whole idea of Hello for Business is it uses the TPM in your laptop. It creates a private public key. Remember that encryption earlier. The private key is in that TPM, that trusted platform module. It's kind of hammer proof. You can't brute force attack it. And now it uses that to authenticate. Now you might say, okay, that's just the laptop. That's one form of authentication, something I have, but I still have to use a pin to unlock it. So it's something I know or a biometric to unlock the machine. And it's something I have because this hello for business is unique to that particular machine. So it's two things, something I know or that I am to unlock it. And it's something I have because I'm unlocking that particular device. Um, so this, the no password is really the utopian what we want to try and get to. So yes, there's things like Hello for Business. Again, there are things like the Authenticator app now. And once again, the Authenticator app, I have to unlock the app and I have to have my phone. So it's, it's still strong authentication, it's two factors. And also there's things like hardware FIDO2 keys. So this is just authentication. This is just the idea that, hey, um, I, I'm trying to improve my overall authentication, the strength. We don't like just password. So if we were over here, we kind of draw a very, very sad face. Um, for this, the SMS call, it's better than nothing. We're kind of neutral. But then when we get to these ones, we're kind of happy. No password is the best, but if we do an MFA with one of these, that's still a great thing. But password on its own, big frowny face. MFA is gonna be the answer to pretty much any question you see about, you need to have strong authentication. If you see MFA written there, um, that, that's going to be your answer, pretty much guaranteed. Now, just really, really quickly, we can kind of see these. So if I jump over to my Azure Active Directory and I go to my security, and from here we can see MFA, there are some options. There's things like fraud alert. So I can turn this on. So if a user gets kind of an alert to say, hey, um, please confirm your authentication, and they didn't request an authentication, they can actually signal that. And then I have the choice to say, hey, if the user signals that, automatically block them who report a fraud. So we can go and dig into it, we can go and do other things, but it will definitely enhance the risk of that user's kind of session. It will know those things. Now, additionally, if I actually go back over here, there are these cloud-based MFA settings, and you'll notice I can pick the verification options. So these are, so I can call to phone, text message, notification through mobile app, verification code from mobile app. You'll also see the idea that, hey, for users, I can do things like enable them, I can disable, I can enforce. This is per user MFA, and generally, we are not going to do that. That is not the preferred approach. The way I want to drive MFA, so for all of these things, I want to use something called conditional access. Conditional access. So these are policies, and one of the outputs, the requirements, could be do an MFA. That's how I want to drive these things. I don't want to make people MFA constantly. They'll get muscle memory to just accept it all the time. I should drive MFA if I'm doing a privileged action, if there's some higher risks detected. That's the best practice. Now, remember, this is kind of a P1, P2 capability to be able to do that. If I don't have P1, P2, then I, I can't use conditional access. So then the other option is if I was like Microsoft 365, it gives you MFA, and then I can do the per user configuration. So I could go in and say, hey, you're enabled, so it will make them register. Once they register, they will then go to enforce. So that's where I'll see those kind of ideas that, hey, I'll enable them, and then once they register, they will move to enforce. 
Now, if I'm just free, um, really what you have is something called security defaults. Now, security defaults, you really don't get to pick anything. So again, for premium P1, P2, I can drive the registration. If I'm P2, I can actually do identity protection to drive the registration. If I'm just M365, yes, I can do that kind of per user thing. If I'm the free, there is security defaults. So security defaults, if we go and look quickly, basically what that's gonna say is, hey, look, um, everyone has to register. If I go back to my Azure AD, go to my properties. Everyone has to register. You can see here down the bottom, manage security defaults. If I set it to yes, which I'm not gonna do because I have conditional access, which is much better, admins would have to use MFA, users would have to do MFA if it's a new device, a new app, or it's some kind of privileged task. So that's if I'm just running the free, I don't have anything else, and hey, uh, I can do that. Now, additionally, you'll see things like kind of self-service password reset. So back over here, if I do password reset, what I can do here is, hey, if passwords maybe forget, users forget their password, I can set different methods they can use to reset their password. So they can do an app code, an email, a mobile phone, an office phone, security questions. There are built-in security questions. Uh, I can add my own security questions. You can pick the ones you want over here. So now, rather than the user having to call the help desk, uh, they can just go in and do this self-service password reset. Um, also, if I'm P1 or P2, they can actually write that back to their regular Active Directory. So this is all about changing password, resetting passwords, uh, unlocking the account. Also, kind of while we're here, we have the idea of kind of blocking simple passwords, so password protection. So once again, if we jump over to security, what we can actually um, see within here with the security option is we have kind of these authentication methods and I have this password protection. So I can automatically ban silly, easily guessed passwords like password and other stuff. But I can also add custom passwords. So for your company, you may have certain passwords. Maybe if you're in Texas, hey, you don't want people to use the word cowboy in their password, or in my case, Savile. So now it would stop people using these. And I can even extend this so they can't be used on premises AD either. So I have this ability to have kind of this uh, relay agent installed on premises that the Active Directory domain controllers would then hook into as well. So I can have this protection. Um, from these very simple passwords. Okay, so that's all about the authentication. Remember, proving who I am, having that strong authentication. Now, after I have proved who I am, then it gets down to authorization. So you think about the auth Z. So what can I do? And there's really two layers to this. I can think about this role-based access control. So this is, well, what roles do I have? And there are roles in both Azure and there are roles in Azure AD. And things like Microsoft 365 use these Azure AD roles. Now there are built-in roles for all of these and I can also add for both of these custom roles. So if the built-in roles don't meet my requirements, I can add a custom role. And we always think about giving someone the role that is just enough to do what they want to do. Don't give them more than what they need. So that's about, hey, what they can do. And then we think about this conditional access. And this is really talking about, hey, you're trying to access a certain app or do a certain thing. I'm gonna look at the surroundings of kind of this request and then maybe have certain requirements. Now, a detailed knowledge of conditional access is way beyond what you need. But if we just looked at it super fast, again, I can kind of go over to my security. We have conditional access. Now, there are things I can do in here like terms of use. 
a terms of use is just a PDF document. And as part of my conditional access, I can pick one of these documents and make them accept it. So here I can have different language versions. I can see the actual document. And here it is. So they would have to kind of accept this. It's very detailed and very strong wording, obviously, and before they'd be allowed to use it. So I can define these terms of use. I can have locations. So a location could be based on particular public IP addresses, maybe like the, the device that faces the internet for my company that does the network address translation, or it could be based on certain geographic locations. So I can actually pick it based on certain countries, things like that. So I can define these certain locations. And then what we have is the policy itself. If I just go to my policies, and I just, I'll pick a very simple one. Here we can assign it to particular users, particular groups. We can exclude certain people. We could also pick it based on certain, if you have a certain directory role. I could pick it based on if it's a guest. I could target particular applications. I can even target actions like, hey, I'm registering my security information. So I'm going through that initial security registration of my phone numbers, my MFA, my self-service password reset. When I get a user to do that, maybe I want a more secure environment. Maybe they have to be on a, a hybrid joined machine. Maybe they have to be on a corporate network. Or I can target particular applications. So these are all of the applications known to my Azure Active Directory. And then I can think about having conditions. So the user risk, the sign-in risk, this comes from identity protection, I need a P2 license. I can target particular platforms, Android, iOS, Windows Phone, and then exclude certain platforms. I could go ahead and if I've defined locations, I can use those here. I could target certain apps, so I've got browser, mobile apps. I could use things like device state. So again, this can come from things like Intune. And then I have the controls. So now it's here, I can have things like, hey, give them, I could block access for one thing, or I can grant access, but make them do an MFA, a stronger authentication. Maybe it has to be marked as compliant by Intune. Maybe it has to be hybrid Azure AD joined. It's an approved app. I need app uh, protection policies. I make them change their password. Again, I can use things like, hey, maybe I've detected higher risk from identity protection, I'm gonna make them do an MFA, or if I require a password, it will make them do an MFA first anyway. Make them accept a certain terms of use document. And then there are things like session controls. Session controls could do things like, hey, make them sign in at a certain interval. I could have things like, hey, if I'm accessing SharePoint and it's from grandma's machine, they can read stuff, but it's limited, they can't save away, they can't write. I can really just control what they can do. So conditional access is all about actually controlling those various things once I've done the authentication. Now I actually want to go and do something. So once you move past the authorization, then we get into the idea of, well, the auditing, the governance. These are obviously very critical things that I have to do. Now, Azure AD, in terms of an all-up identity lifecycle governance, does not really have natively. Now, what it can do is it can integrate with kind of HR systems. So, for example, if I had a workday system, as an example, it can do things like integrate to Azure AD. There's a provisioning service. And even if I'm using Active Directory, when I go and make those HR requests, there's a special component in Azure AD Connect to Azure AD Cloud Sync that would actually enable those to bounce back onto on-prem and then replicate back up to Azure AD. So I, I can use that as part of if I had an existing HR system, I can leverage that. But a big thing you'll do is things like groups. So remember the idea about those dynamic groups. I'll use that. I can build a dynamic group based off the attributes of the user, and then from those groups, those groups have, remember, the apps, the roles, the licenses. So I'm gonna focus on that. I can use things like privileged identity management. So PIM gives me the ability to elevate up to a certain role for a finite amount of time. 
but I can also use it to say, hey, you have this role, but you only have it for three months. So again, PIM can drive the role to make sure it's not left behind. I don't keep things that I really shouldn't have. We have things like access reviews. So an access review is a feature that lets me say, hey, um, based on maybe this app assignment, or this role, or this group membership, we're going to review this periodically. And that could be an administrator does the review, it could be someone's delegated to do the review, it could be a self-review. I have to go and check, hey, do I still need this thing? And, and all of these are kind of P2 features. Remember those terms of use? I can use those through conditional access. Um, there's Azure AD Identity Protection to really drive the overall um, health and protection of the user. But those things can really help govern. Now, all of these, remember, are P2. Digital Identity Management, Access Reviews, Azure AD Identity Protection. There's also kind of entitlement packages they let me say, for example, hey, this SharePoint site and this group membership, I can go and request a certain entitlement package. And that's also a P2 feature. But we've got to bring all of those various things. Of course, there's, there's loggings. I, I have all of those capabilities. But in the interest of time. OK, so that's really kind of the, the Azure part, the identity part. Well, then we can think about, well, outside of Azure AD, then we have Azure, kind of one of the things I'm super passionate about. And obviously, we have to think about the governance side of Azure, and that's huge. So we, we can think about from a, a governance perspective, that's, that's kind of the first thing we, we ever need to do. Now, at the root of an Azure, AD, an Azure is there's an Azure AD tenant. Azure subscriptions trust a certain Azure AD tenant. And then I can build kind of a management group hierarchy under this. There's going to be a root management group once I enable them. And then I can have a hierarchy of kind of management groups. And then ultimately, what I'll get is subscriptions where I create things. So I'm going to get some subscription. And then inside the subscription, I create resource groups. And I can have multiple resource groups. I have lots of subscriptions. And then I actually create resources. And this is really key to the idea of the, the governance around my environment. Because the, to all of these things, all of these levels, I can have things like role-based access control. So a certain role you have. I can apply things like policy, what you can do. And I can have budgets. Uh, what you can spend. So they drive a lot of the behavior. Now also, one of the big things I can do is I can do locking on resources. And you'll see there's different types of lock. So there's something called cannot delete. And then there's also a read only. Now obviously, as the name suggests, if I do a cannot delete, I can change it. I could change the resource, but I can't delete it. If it's read only, I can't even change it. So I'm locking something exactly in place. And it does inherit. So if I put a lock on it, a resource group or a sub, it does everything inside it. An important point of these, this is at the management plane, i.e. the Azure Resource Manager. It does not impact the data plane. So if this was a storage account, I can't if I did a read only, I can still change the data inside there. It's not impacting those behaviors. This is making sure I don't do things on the management plane. So I have all of these great things. And the way we really like to deploy resources, again, a good governance thing, is we use an Azure Resource Manager template. So I can define this JSON template that defines kind of all of the resources we have in a very declarative fashion, and then I apply it. So I can change control, version control, that thing. It's always going to create things. It's immutable. I can rerun it, and because it's declarative, I what I want it to look like, it just makes sure it matches that description. 
So that's how we want to deploy things. And what you'll often hear about is the idea that, hey, look, I want to deploy to a subscription in a very standard way. I want to deploy these resources. So what you'll actually hear about is something called a blueprint. And a blueprint is really a collection of things. I can define resource groups. I can define role-based access control, i.e. the permissions. I can assign policy, and I can assign ARM templates. And with that, when I do that deployment, it has its own set of locks. It does not use these locks. It uses its own special types of locks. They're basically based on deny assignments. But I can say, well, don't lock. I, I'm deploying these sets of things, but they can do what they want with it afterwards. They can delete them, do anything they want. I can say, do not delete. I, again, they can change the config. But they can't get rid of it. Or I can say, read only. I'm stamping down this configuration, but you can't change anything about it. So if I had the idea that, hey, I want to be able to lay down to subscriptions, uh, a standard set of config, Blueprint's going to be the answer. Because I can create the resource groups where resources are created. I can assign roles. I can assign policy to set the guardrails around it. Then I can actually deploy the resources with an ARM template. And you can really think about that in terms of an Azure resource, if you ever see the idea that, hey, I want to de define guardrails, that's policy. So I can think about, hey, you can only use these regions. I'm only allowed to create this type of account. I must have this tag configured. That's always going to be policy. And I can use that in multiple ways. I can actually use that for both enforcement i.e. it has to match that, or I can actually use it just for tracking compliance. So I'm not maybe going to lock it down, but I'll know if it's not in that state. So I have all of those different options. And of course, role-based access control is this, I have these various permissions. Now you can absolutely go and kind of create all of these things yourself. But what you'll find is Microsoft has this big push right now about this cloud adoption framework. And what this cloud adoption framework is, it's a set of documentation and guidance and best practices and tools that basically set up these kind of best practice configurations things for you. And you'll see there's various uh, phases to this. If we actually go and look at this quickly on their site, it really walks through what these key phases are. So you'll see firstly there's a strategy. Once you've done the strategy, then you'll kind of um, you'll have some planning. Then you're kind of ready to actually get these things up and running. Then you're going to adopt, and adopt includes migration and innovation. And if I actually click on a different link, you can kind of see this in a nicer picture. Here we go. So you can see the idea of the life cycle is all about define the strategy, plan, you're ready, and then you adopt. And of course, all of these things is kind of the governance and the management. And they're going to help drive all of those kind of different things through this cloud adoption framework. Okay. So that has all of those kind of tooling things as part of it. Now, when I'm thinking about kind of the security and the compliance, we think about the network, the data, all of those different things. There are a number of kind of key constructs in Azure. So if I'm thinking about network and data, the first thing is obviously we define this virtual network. So we have the idea of a virtual network. And the way we control access, we segment that, is we have the concept of a network security group. A network security group is based around the IP addresses, the ports, and the protocol. 
So the destination and source IP, the destination and source port, and the protocol, TCP, UDP. So I define these rules and then say allow or deny, and I create a set of these rules and I apply it to a subnet. I can apply it to a NIC as well, that's not typically done. So I create these rules and it helps me segment. If you think about a virtual network, it has multiple subnets, portions of the IP space, but also things coming in and out of the virtual network. Maybe going to other virtual networks that appeared, maybe networks that are connected via express route or site to site VPN. So that helps me lock it down. You might see something called app security, application security groups. That's really a, a tag on the network interface that I can use in place of the IP address. So it's kind of an IP address um, or a tag. There's, there's built in ones as well. And then around that, I might think about when I have public IP addresses, I might have distributed denial of service protection. And there's kind of both a basic and a standard. This is giving me basic, gives everyone this real time uh, mitigation of common attacks. Um, with the standard, I can tune it more through traffic monitoring, through machine learning. Uh, I can have custom policies. I can also have things like Azure Firewall. Now, Azure Firewall is an appliance that lives inside kind of my virtual network. And with Azure Firewall, I can do, it's a managed network virtual appliance. It's going to auto scale based on the amount of traffic, but it has native high availability. I can filter on things like IP address, but also fully qualified domain names. So the names of services it's trying to talk to. It can do outbound source network address translation, um, so kind of hide the eye internal, and do things like DNAT um, with threat intelligence. If I have services that I'm offering out to the internet, well, often I'm gonna have resources and if it's like HTTP, HTTPS based, um, or maybe I'm using Azure Front Door, you'll see there's things like Web Application Firewall. So Web Application Firewall provides protection from common exploits. There's a core rule set that this is giving me protection from, but things like App Gateway, the Content Delivery Network, the Azure Front Door, can all hook into this web application firewall. It's like a SQL injection attack. It's gonna give me protection from those things. Now maybe I wanna to get to resources inside the virtual network. And again, the point of this is just at a high level, know what these things do. So maybe I've got kind of a virtual machine I want to get to. Maybe it's RDP, if it's Windows, or SSH, if it's Linux. I wanna securely get to it. So then we have a service called the Azure Bastion. And the Azure Bastion service lets me from the Azure portal, so I'm in the portal, I can see my VM, I can hit connect, select Bastion, and it goes via the Bastion to give me an RDP or SSH connection to my virtual machine. I don't have to worry about opening up firewall ports or configuration or any of those things. It gives me access to the resources inside my virtual network or now connected virtual networks. So that's things about on the network side and protecting the network. Network security groups were must have. Um, Azure Firewall, again, I can do more advanced filtering and fully qualified domain names. Um, offering services out to the internet, distributed denial of service protection, web application firewalls on things like the app gateway, content delivery network, front door. If I want to be able to get to resources, hey, Bastion gives me a great way to do that. Now on the data side, often we have things like storage accounts. And the storage accounts can have blobs and queues and tables and files. Well, we think about encryption at rest. So we're gonna encrypt that. And it could be a platform managed key where Microsoft store the key and take care of the key and rotate the key. Or it can be things like a customer managed key. So here we use things like Key Vault. And I have a customer managed key that is used for that kind of, to protect the data encryption key. Um, also, if it was a virtual machine, 
There's things like Azure Disk Encryption that uses things like BitLocker or DMCrypt inside the OS running inside the VM uh, to do that encryption as well. Things like SQL have transparent data encryption. And this key vault is a super powerful construct. I can have secrets, which is a piece of data that I can write to and extract back out, maybe like a password or a token. I can have keys, so that's saying I, I generate in there, import in there, but I can't get it back out. But I can perform cryptographic operations inside the key vault using that key. And then certs, certificates, which are really just wrapped keys, but it can manage the whole kind of life cycle around that. Now within my Azure world, there's all these different components. And in terms of the security, that there's different solutions here. But really the big one is going to be kind of this Azure Security Center. So the Azure Security Center is this Cloud Security Posture Management, a CSPM. It's about knowing about my environment and what I want to improve. And so the ASC has a number of core things. It has a secure score. So this is built up by using things like Azure Policy to go and get compliance state of a number of built-in things it really cares about and lets me know what, what should I really be targeting. So if we jump over and look at an environment, if I actually go, let's close some of this stuff down. If I just go and look at my security center, front and center, we'll see my secure score. I have things like different regulatory compliance things I can care about. So I can actually manage the compliance policies that I care about and I can, hey, I'll pick my dev subscription. I can actually see, hey, there is all these other ones that I've got, Azure Security Benchmark, PCI DSS, but I can add more from ones that they have natively. But also I just have that basic secure score. And this is basically giving me things I should care about. So it's going to order them in terms of priority. So like enable MFA, that's the biggest improvement I could have to my score. So it gives me places to start to really help improve my overall security posture. So it's giving me the security baseline. I can have alerting. It has things like a network map to know what's going on in my environment. So I, I can see everything there. I can see different security alerts that I have going on in my environment. And then we have things like Defender. So Defender has both deep protection and broad protection. And we can see right here, it's, there's different types of Defender available. But on my subscription, I can actually turn on Azure Defender. And then it shows me the difference between, hey, when it's off and I just have the basic Azure Security Center, and then when I turn it on, I get, hey, just-in-time VM access, uh, app controls, regulatory compliance, all these other things. And then I have these deep and broad protections. So I can turn on protection for app service, SQL, storage, Kubernetes. And then these broad protections about things like resource manager and DNS. So I can pick and turn these things on, uh, but obviously there, there's a price I pay for these. But I can have things like continuous export out to other solutions and maybe another SIM tool. So I, I have these capabilities, but things like just-in-time protection is where, hey, normally the ports are closed to the virtual machine, but it's going to turn on when I need it. So it, it adds these various components. So for all of my Azure services, I can send data um, through these various solutions. Now, the next solution you'll commonly see is, yes, we think about Azure Security Center, and Azure Security Center is all about, hey, um, what is my kind of compliance? So it's going to tell me, hey, what is my compliance state? Um, it's going to tell me things like, hey, I, I want to do my protection within here. And then you'll hear about something called Sentinel. And Sentinel is built on a log analytics workspace. So we underneath Sentinel is this log analytics workspace that essentially has connectors. Now those connectors can be to a whole number of different things. They could be to Azure AD, to Microsoft 365. Um, again, Azure resources can send into this thing. 
And what Sentinel then adds on top of that is getting the logs from things on its own is pretty useless. I'm going to get a deluge of different data. So what Azure Sentinel adds is things like, yes, it's got the logging, it adds all these different types of connectors, then it adds things like machine learning on top of the logs to actually give me analysis. So it's kind of a, a SIM solution, a security incident and event management solution. I can also orchestrate an automated response to so a source solution. And so what that's going to give me is the ability to actually respond and recover. And if you think about this is generating alerts, well, it can send them into here. So then Sentinel can build on that. So if I jump over again, super quickly, and if I now search for Sentinel, we can see I've got a basic Sentinel workspace, and, and really it gives me the ability to go and hunt. I can run queries for various types of things to find various types of attack based on the logs in that log analytics workspace. Um, I can look at the different incidents, um, I can see an overall kind of health status of my environment, any malicious uh, events that are happening. So it's looking at the logs and then drawing like good conclusions out of them. But then we have these kind of data connectors and we have this ability to connect to all these different types of systems, including Azure AD, Azure AD identity protection, but also we'll see things like, hey, look, Microsoft 365. Um, Defender, Office 365. So we can take all of those and build it in to let Sentinel actually give us um, protection for all of those different types of things. And so when we talk about Microsoft 365, so let's move on to that. So that's kind of that last piece is kind of the Microsoft 365. Now, the biggest uh, initial piece we think about from the protection is Defender. And there's really four different parts of Defender. You'll see there's Defender for identity. Now, this is really taking what was kind of the Azure Advanced Threat Protection, the Azure ATP, and now it's this Defender um, for identity. So what this is looking at is essentially my on-premises Active Directory domain controllers. It's getting signals from those, sending them up to the cloud, and then detecting attacks and threats on my on-prem dom domain controllers. So this kind of would sit side by side with things like identity protection that's looking at my uh, Azure AD health state. Okay, so just then my whole setup crashed. I guess it's telling me to hurry up. You're taking too long recording this. Uh, so anyway, so after the identity piece, which is really all about the on-premises domain controllers, uh, the next piece of that is the endpoint. Now, if we think about, there's already kind of defender, just regular anti-malware protection. So what this does is this adds additional detection and prevention, looking at things like what's the entry point for an attack, um, what happened? It went from this user to that user. Gives me that whole forensic analysis capability um, of that. This used to be Defender ATP, but it's really about getting that complete tracking, and that's for Windows, Android, Linux, Mac OS. Then there's kind of uh, cloud app security. So this is a, a CASB, a cloud app security broker solution. This enables me to really track, well, what are the applications being spoken to um, from my corporation. It helps me track things like kind of bring your own IT department where people are using applications that I as a company have maybe not authorized. So this can be all about discovery. And also, if I do things like I manage the um, integration with conditional access, for example, if I have proxies, I can then actually control how they can use those various services as well. Like if I suddenly see someone um, copying a whole bunch of documents, like data exfiltration, I can actually stop them. And then there's kind of the Defender for Office 365. And you may have seen the idea where you get kind of the, the safe attachments, the, the safe links, it gives me anti-phishing protection, 
Um, for collaboration like OneDrive and SharePoint and Teams, there's different levels of functionality, but it's really all about giving me that ability to protect my users that are using Office 365. Again, for those detonation chambers, how I get an attachment, you can go and put it in this isolated chamber, run it, make sure it's not doing something bad, uh, tracking all those links. Now we do always think about layers, that whole defense in depth. So I can think about, uh, from a layer perspective, obviously there's kind of the identity. I can think about there's the device and there's the data. Obviously the identity, we talked about all the Azure AD, all the elements of that. So I really wanna focus on kind of the data behind my Office, my Microsoft 365, my Office 365, and then the device. Now we saw the idea within Azure, there is Security Center. So for Microsoft 365, there is also a Security Center. And just like with Azure, it has a number of different elements. It has its own kind of secure score, which again gives me the points where things I should focus on to have the most impact, the most bang for the buck, so to speak, where I should prioritize. But there's all kind of reporting and incidents and kind of much more. So if we jump over, let's take a look at this. So here, the kind of this is our new starting point for the, the Microsoft 365. And we can see it guides us through. We have this whole wizard we could walk through. But it's showing me things like, hey, look, here's my secure score, uh, 35.6, which is obviously terrible. But I can see it historically, I can see, well, what's changed around that secure score? I could actually look at things, well, how can I improve my score? And notice again, it's showing me, hey, what's the score impact? And again, MFA, so you'll see some common things, both Azure and Microsoft 365 obviously use Azure AD. So the identity things will be common, but then they'll branch off. Azure will talk about things like networks and uh, appliances. Office will talk about, hey, look, I can do cloud app security, um, customer lockbox, other types of things. So I can look at this to very quickly get an idea of, well, what do I care about? Then also from this kind of Microsoft 365 Security Center, I can see, hey, look, are there any particular incidents and that maybe I, I care about through my environment? I can see, hey, if there's alerts, and again, we can turn on the Microsoft 365 Defender. We have kind of threat analytics, search centers, and then you'll see a, a whole bunch of other things like auditing, reporting, health, uh, various different aspects, which we'll actually come back to uh, in a little bit. But before we really dive into the, that level of detail, I do want to pivot back quickly to kind of the device area. Now, on an on-premises world, we had Active Directory, we have Group Policy, we might have System Center Configuration Manager that does patching and app and inventory. In a modern work place environment, we think about Azure AD joint. Well, there's no group policy. So what we kind of come off of from here is we have Intune. Now Intune does a number of different things. I can think about, well, I have policy. I can get health status. I can drive um, many other aspects of this. Now this is across many, many different platforms. I can think about, well, Windows is an obvious one, but I also have things like, well, Mac OS. I can think about um, Android and kind of iOS and slash the iPad OS. So it really is about the, the end client device. This is not for servers. This is about the client end device. And there's really two kind of modes in which Intune uh, can work. Now there's many more aspects to it, but for what we care about, I have these devices and I can think about MDM. And the key point here is device. I can spell. So mobile device management. 
So this means I'm basically enrolling the device. So that means what Intune can do is anything about that whole device. Um, I can think about doing configuration of the device, I can do policy of the device, I can push certificates to the device, VPN configurations. I am enrolling the device. So this is going to be typically for kind of corporate assets. Where it's okay that as a company, I'm doing that complete management. Now the other one is MAM. And the key point here is application. So I'm not enrolling the device in this. This is just particular apps and typically based on, hey, they go and talk to a corporate source, I can then push just an app policy. So now I'm thinking app policy. I can't enforce things at the entire device level, but when they launch the app that connects to a corporate data source, think of like the Outlook client, talking to Exchange Online, then I can say, hey, you're talking to a corporate mailbox, um, then you have to have this policy. Maybe I have to do a pin when I actually type in. The enterprise apps are in their own little sandbox. So this is kind of uh, my device, not my corporation's device. As a corporation, I can wipe the corporate managed applications, but I can't wipe the entire device, which I could do in this kind of MDM world. So there's kind of an important distinction between those mobile device management, mobile application management, Again, corporate device, I'm putting my personal device. We talked about these policies, and these policies can have things like requirements, and like uh, maybe uh, they're not jailbroken if it's a mobile device, antivirus versions, various other types of things. I can have security baselines if it's a Windows 10 device. So think about Intune as the policy engine that's typically gonna go with Azure Active Directory. There is no group policy. This is how, and I can also push things like applications, um, both custom and from kind of the marketplace. Uh, I can do those things. So I did want to just kind of touch on that uh, kind of important point. Now, if we talk about the security center, well, then we kind of think about, okay, great, that's security. Then we start caring about Compliance. And so just as you would expect, there is a sort of compliance center as well. So if we jump over to here. Now, once again, we can see there's, well, we have this kind of compliance manager solution. This is an end-to-end -end solution to actually let me track my overall compliance for Microsoft 365. You can see once again, there's kind of a compliance score. I can see where I'm getting the various points about things that I care about. Once again, I can go and assign and track um, dates to where it should be done by, who should be doing it. I have kind of that complete control of all of those different things. In addition, we do have kind of, if we do a show all, there's a whole bunch of kind of different solutions, auditing, content search, data loss prevention, data subject, e-discovery, and I'm, I'm gonna kind of talk through um, these various aspects. But a key point of kind of this compliance center, you can see, hey, look at the compliance manager, look at the catalog to start identifying risk. And again, if I go into that compliance manager, it's going to show me though, hey, the things that I'm responsible for, which I'm doing a terrible job, and the things Microsoft are managing, good job on them, they've done everything, just making me look bad. And the things I should really try and focus around to be successful. Now you're seeing here, we have kind of auditing. Now the whole point here is in this auditing, I can go in and actually search for various types of things. I can see all these different types of activities are available to me. I could ping for certain users on certain data, start end times, and actually perform that search. Now there's also kind of audit retention policies. So I could create a policy based around, well, a duration, so actually up to 10 years, 
and for what types of data. So I do have controls around exactly what I care about. Now, when I perform a search of this audit, it is important to note not everything is going to show up straight away. Uh, some things take 30 minutes, some things can take up to a day. We can actually drill down and we can see in the documentation it does distinguish, hey, things that take 30 minutes and things that take 24 hours. We can kind of see that here. So if you are interested, the documentation does go through, hey, based on the source, how long will it actually take to be able to actually search? So that's kind of just the, the regular auditing I, I can do from this. Again, there's this advanced auditing as well that I can do for forensic, for compliance investigations. And again, we kind of get one year for the Exchange SharePoint Azure AD, but it, it is going to 10 years uh, with some additional licensing. Now, the next part is the, the data. So remember we talked about, so that's overall compliance. That's kind of great. We have a solution there. And we had this whole idea of the data. So Intune does the device. The identity we kind of know, well, that, that's all those kind of Azure AD things. Well, then we have the data. Now, for the data, there's many different aspects to this. But often we, we may not know what data we have. So there's often this idea of, well, we have to classify the data. And then once we classify the data, we can kind of protect. Now, protect can mean many different things. Protect can mean things like encrypt. It can be things like data loss prevention. This could be stopping me doing something with it. It could be watermarking it. But I can, based on those encryptions, I can drive certain types of policy. And again, this all comes from kind of that compliance um, page. So if we go back over here, notice we have under the solutions, if I actually just go home for a second, we have data classification. Now there's different types of classification. I can think about classification in terms of sensitive information types. So PII, credit card numbers, social security numbers, driving licenses, there's a whole number of those built in. So that's one way to classify data is sensitive information. Which there's a huge number. These are built on looking for certain words, looking for certain combinations of characters. Then there are trainable classifiers. So once again, there's a number of them built in. Things like I'm looking for resumes, looking for source code, looking for harassment, looking for profanity, looking for threats. Um, or I can create my own. I can create trainable um, classifiers based on what I care about. Now with these sensitive labels, I can uh, assign a label to documents. And then once I have those kind of classifications done, well, I can do things about protecting it. You'll see things like data loss prevention. So I can do things around encryption. I can do things around um, rights management, that data loss protection. So I can have things like restricting ability to share. I can have things like adding a watermark. Additionally, there is also the aspect maybe, hey, look, there's, there's the classification that drives protection, but I might also drive retention. I need to keep my data. So here I might have things like, well, do not delete. I have to keep it for a certain amount of time. Or maybe it's the opposite. Maybe it is delete, uh, get, get rid of this after a certain amount of time. Sometimes they can be um, equally important to the overall solution. Now, a lot of these can actually be built around the idea of, I have this kind of e-discovery. Mixing cases there. Where, hey look, I need to find. So I have to find the content, and then I, I'm doing something with it. 
Um, maybe it's exporting it out, maybe it's doing an investigation around it, but then there's some kind of action from that e-discovery. And there's actually three different solutions that we have as part of Microsoft 365. So there's a very basic content search. Then there's a more advanced core e-discovery. Now the core e-discovery is built around the idea of, well, I can create a case and then from the case, I can do things like a hold on the data to make sure someone doesn't delete it. Then I can search and I can export. Then there's an advanced e-discovery. And that really builds on the idea. So if this one is all about, hey, I have a case, and from the case, I can do a search, hold, and then maybe an, an export. This builds on that and adds things like data custodians, um, much richer sets of investigation. So if we jump back over, if we go and look at content search, you'll see we actually dive into, well, hey, this is just the ability to do this, this kind of basic search. I can type in data and I can go and find stuff. But then we have this e-discovery down here, which is this richer set of capability. So we have the core e-discovery, so we create the case. And then once we create the case, then I can actually go and hold data, search it, and optionally export. Or we have the advanced. So with the advanced e-discovery, once again, I would now go and create a case. But then I would actually go and add to this data custodians. For example, they're, they're the people of interest. Maybe they own a mailbox, maybe they own a SharePoint site. I can then say I want to preserve the data, collect the data, pre-process pre the data, uh, review, then export. Now, when I add custodians to this, it will actually try and find data they own. So it will go and find their mailboxes. Um, it will find their OneDrive, or I can add additional things like SharePoint sites and Microsoft Teams, etc. So we have these kind of three core tools um, actually available to us. And for all of these things, uh, it can actually take up to 24 hours. So if I think about all of these holds, that hold can take 24 hours to actually take effect. And there's various roles, there's like e-discovery managers to manage and create cases. There's PowerShell scripts for more advanced searches. There's all these various different things. So this is all around the, the data. So again, identity, Azure AD. The device, Intune, and I can use that, things like conditional access can check on that health. Data, classify it so I know what I have. Most companies don't know what they have. Then I could protect it, which is encryption. I might do DLP. Uh, maybe there's things around retention. I want to be able to find the data I care about. And then finally, from a, a maybe a compliance perspective and more, there's other things we care about. So I want to think about um, insider risk management. So insider risk management is a solution that's really all about malicious people internally. I want to be able to detect the risk. I want to be able to act on those risky, malicious actions. For example, they're trying to share data or get a whole bunch of data. So I can have policies based on a template that I can have triggered, and when they trigger based on those things I've defined, it will create an alert. It's so based on the conditions, it generates an alert, and then that could be triaged. Um, I alerts that have to be reviewed, and then I can investigate and then perform some action. It could be a notification, uh, it could be more. So this is about, so again, you have to know the solution and what it's there for. Insider risk management is about helping detect and prevent malicious actions for insider people. Then I can think about, well, communication, compliance. 
So this is all about the idea that I have acceptable communication policies in my company. Um, maybe on Teams, for example, or on email. So this is all about communication compliance is saying, look, I'm going to put in policies, maybe no profanity, um, how we treat each other. And so now if people go around those policies, I could tag the message. Um, I could notify users. I can monitor the overall compliance. So this is really about, hey, the communications going on. I have standards for my company about how my employees should treat each other. I can detect that. So tag the messages, notify users, um, actually halt those types of communications. Then we have information barrier. So as the name really suggests, that this could be the idea that I have different groups of users in my company and they shouldn't talk. For example, on Teams, um, they shouldn't chat with those people or share files with those people. Um, so I can really think about this. This can be across things like Teams, SharePoint, um, and OneDrive. So with this solution, I can say, look, these groups of people, maybe for legal reasons, uh, compliance, whatever that might be, I don't want them to communicate directly. So if I see a question, hey, you need to stop these groups within the company being able to communicate on Teams or, or share documents, well, that's going to be the information barrier solution. Now, I mentioned PIM for Azure AD, Privileged Identity Management. So Microsoft 365 has PAM. So privileged access management. So if you think about PIM is all about giving me a role for a certain amount of time, just enough. PAM is actually a lower level. It's a task. So PAM is about giving me a certain task at a certain scope um, as I request it. And there's a full ability to have um, permissions and authorization as part of that, but it lets me get just this smaller set of capabilities. So as a user, I can request, say, hey, I need this particular task, and it can be granted to me. So it's, it's really a lower level than PIM. And then there's kind of customer lockbox. And this is all about really a Microsoft um, help desk engineer type person. So I raise a call with Microsoft. They need to access my service to help me. They put in a request. The manager at Microsoft has to approve it. Then it goes to you as the customer to approve to let them get access to your service. And there's a whole flow around this. If I actually open up the site, we can actually see, hey, in Office 365, so obviously this is your data, you care about this. It talks about the flow. So hey, look, you've got issues with your mailbox, you open up a ticket, the sport engineer wants to see it, so they raise via customer lockbox, hey, I wanna access this. Their manager has to approve it, and then you as the customer sign in, and then you approve it, and then they, the engineer can go and do that work, and you can actually track Remember, all actions are in the audit log. So you can actually go and review exactly what they did. So this is giving you kind of full access as the customer. What are they doing within my subscription? What did we cover? I mean, a massive amount of stuff, obviously. The key point here is you do not need to know details about any of this stuff. You need to understand, hey, look, what are kind of the key concepts about defense in depth? Uh, what are the key types of threat? Are they attacking data? Are they attacking the identity? Are they attacking our ability to do business? Um, what does zero trust mean? What are the kind of shared responsibilities we have over the types of service? Where do we focus on? What is the type of encryption? Hey, look, if I want to send someone a protected message, what do I need? Well, I would need their public key. Hey, uh, if I want to digitally sign a message, 
well then I need my private key and then they would need my public key to be able to the key point is your private key never leaves you there's no scenario you give that to someone else symmetric and asymmetric what are the six privacy principles you need to understand what they are the whole trust that service trust portal is going to be your go-to place and from there we can get to all different types of data so come and look around that Azure AD is used by Azure and Microsoft 365 we think about the administration, the authentication. Authentication always happens first. Who I am, proving that. Authorization, what I can do, audit, or what did you do? I track those things. We think modern authentication. Uh, really, MFA is all about giving me a strong authentication. That's what we want to do. So I think about, hey, MFA, I can do a phone call, a text message, or I can use stronger, better things like tokens and the app, or I go password list completely. Important to understand the types of objects we have in Azure AD. If someone I'm collaborating with, hey, as a company, I want to collaborate with this person, it's going to be a guest, a B2B. If I'm writing an app for consumers, I'm going to use B2C. If I have an application, it's going to have a service principle. If it's an Azure resource that I want to be able to use other things, I can have a managed identity. Assigned and dynamic groups, very powerful. It helps me do a lot of life cycle because based on the group membership, I can assign apps and licenses and roles. My devices can join or be registered or be hybrid. So have lots of different things there. Um, we talked about authorization is things like role-based access control. There are roles in Azure and Azure AD. And then we have conditional access. On the identity side, things like privilege identity management for just in time access to a role. Access reviews to track what you have. Do you still need that app or that group membership or that role? It can be self, someone can be delegated. Identity protection to detect risk, to drive things like MFA registration. And I can use identity protection as part of conditional access to detect risky sign-ins or risky users. And then you kind of move on to the actual then Azure overall governance these different levels, we have policy, um, budgets, RBAC, blueprints can stamp down configurations. Cloud adoption framework is kind of this pre-package which has various phases to it. The network, different layers of protection of the network. Encryption of the data, security center, Sentinel. And then Microsoft 365, the types of Defender. What I do with the device, I manage that with Intune. Enroll the device, MDM, or just the app, MAM. Classify the data. We have those trainable things to if it's sensitive data, um, other types of data we want to know once we classify it. I can encrypt it. I can do data loss prevention on it. I can use retention rules. I can use e-discovery in different modes to go and find things and various compliance solutions. So we covered uh, a huge amount. Again, it's just breadth. You don't need to know the detail of any of these things, but you should just know, um, hey, they, and remember, it's multiple choice. They're going to give you a list of solutions. You just have to know which one is the right solution. Or they're going to tell you a solution. You have to know what it does. There's nothing complicated about the naming. If you just look at, like, compliance, they're not trying to trick you. There's no one at Microsoft that wants you to have some, well, what does this do? They're logical names. If I see a question, hey, I want to restrict communication between these groups of people, well, that sounds like a barrier. So pick the one that sounds most like it. Uh, remember things like service trust. That's where I'm going to go to find out about audit reports, all those other things. So just think of it logically. Uh, always attempt every question. There's no such thing as losing points for getting it wrong. Often some of the answers, it says, is, is it made of cheese? And it's like, well, it's definitely not cheese. You can eliminate some obviously wrong questions. Um, but just give it your best. And again, don't panic over things um, it's just an exam if you don't pass the first time you'll get a score report that will kind of tell you where you're weaker you can then go and redouble your efforts focus on those and you'll get it the next time um, so that was it i really hope this was useful again please like uh, subscribe comment and share and um, good luck